downtown Manhattan, at 33 Liberty Street, sits the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The bank is the largest of the 12 reserve banks in terms of assets, volume of activity, and number of employees. The building was designed by the firm of York and Sawyer. Philip Sawyer, principal architect, had studied extensively in Italy. He planned his design, reminiscent of several Renaissance palaces in Florence, to suggest the secure, stable character demanded by the Federal Reserve's role in the economy. Completed in 1924, the building is formed of limestone and sandstone blocks. The wrought iron adornments were designed and forged by the Russian metal worker Samuel Yellen. In 1969, New York City's Landmarks Preservation Commission designated the frame of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as an historical landmark. The bank has invited the American Numismatic Society to show some of its many fine coins in a newly designed exhibit space on the first floor of the bank. We invite you into the bank now to view this exhibit and learn about the history of money. When we think of money, we think of coins, drachmas, doubloons, and dollars. Beautiful and valuable, coins are more than just money. Coins reveal history. Hello, I'm Dr. Ute Wartenberg, Executive Director of the American Numismatic Society. Welcome to Drachmas, Doubloons, and Dollars, A History of Money, an exhibition organized by the American Numismatic Society and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Numismatics is the study of coins. Coins are not only of interest because of their monetary value, but also for the information they give to historians and economists. Here, for example, a $20 gold piece of 1852 formerly in the collection of J.P. Morgan, now in the collection of the American Numismatic Society. The coins in this exhibition come primarily from this collection located here in New York City. Our museum is dedicated to the study of coins. We have one of the best collections of coins in the world and a large library of books about coins, both available to the public. Hello, I'm Robert Hogue curator of United States Coins and Currency at the American Numismatic Society. People often ask how we acquire the coins in our collection. More than 80% of the items are donations made by collectors and our society's members. Coins can be found almost everywhere. Some, such as these United States silver dollars, can still be found where they were dropped, in parks or playgrounds. Drachmas and doubloons, however, are not likely to be found as stray finds. Instead, they are often from a hoard. Coin hoards are collections of coins, as few as two or three, or as many as several thousand, set aside for safekeeping. In ancient times, when there were no banks, it was difficult for people to keep their private savings safely. The owner of a hoard would often hide coins to protect them. Such hoards were often deposited in times of war, because some owners were never able to reclaim their treasures, these hoards remain hidden until they are discovered during archaeological excavations, farming, construction projects such as road building, during landslides or hard rains, or with the aid of metal detectors. In addition to hoards on land, there are also hoards at sea. Ships carried coins to be used in trading. Shipwrecks often reveal treasure cargoes as can be seen in these coins from the shipwreck of the SS Central America. Salvage of this important wreck with its great cargo of gold has revealed many coins from the California Gold Rush of 1849. Another question we are frequently asked is how coins are made. Throughout history, there were principally two methods, casting and striking. In ancient and medieval times, coins were hand-struck. A flan of metal was placed between the anvil die and the punch die and struck. And now we have the coin. The screw press or balancier, such as this one, was introduced in Europe early in the 16th century. The screw press was valued because it made the relief on coins very sharp and clear. Other types of machines, such as the roller press, soon followed, but men still continued to strike coins with hammer and anvil in many countries. 
Eventually, in the 19th century, steam power replaced human power, and the modern knuckle press took the place of the screw press. The electric-powered hydraulic coin presses of today still use handcrafted dies like this one from 1806, created by artists for the same purpose. Casting is the second process by which coins are produced. In East Asia, most coinage was produced by pouring liquid metal into a mold. The coins come out of the mold in a tree and were broken off and filed down to a standard size. Casting coins allows for their creation much faster than by hand striking. Although casting was used in many areas of East Asia, it was primarily a feature of the Chinese imperial dynasties. The use of the casting process allowed the Chinese emperors to produce vast quantities of coins in a very short period of time. Because of this advantage, many civilizations, including the Romans, cast coins at some point in history. The casting method has drawbacks. The main problem is that coins made from casts are very easy to counterfeit. It also wastes a great deal of metal. Despite these limitations, however, the Chinese continued to use cast coinage rather than struck until the advent of machine-made coins in the 19th century. We hope that this brief introduction has begun to answer some of your questions about the history of money. But before you tour the exhibition, stay and watch the remainder of the film, which will show you how coins are made today in the Philadelphia Mint. Whether it is a commemorative coin or one of the many we carry in our pockets today, it begins with an artist creating a design. The design is then interpreted on a clay model using various sculpting tools to capture the details. The clay model is then made into a plaster model. A mint mark is placed on the plaster model indicating where the coin will be struck. S stands for San Francisco. There is a D for Denver, P or no mint mark for Philadelphia, and W for West Point. From an original plaster model, a rubber negative mold is prepared. Then we pour epoxy and make a model that will withstand the transfer engraving machine. This process reduces the model to the actual size of a coin, about one-tenth the diameter. The machine traces over all the artwork while the corresponding cutting tool carves an identical image into steel for a die. The machine moves very slowly. It takes approximately three days for the die to be made. Next, the die is brought to the press room. Work starts here at the blanking press. This coiled roll of metal is as long as five football fields and it will be used to make 325,000 nickels. In the past, most coins had some gold or silver in them. Today, most are made from a blend of nickel and copper. Just like a giant cookie cutter, this press punches out blanks. The blanks are collected here, and the rest of the metal, called webbing, is shredded and recycled. The blanks move on to furnaces where they are heated. Then they are cooled, washed, and dried. The blanks are still warm when they move on to their next stop, the riddling machine. The riddling machine shakes out any blanks that are the wrong size or shape. The riddled blanks tumble into the upsetting machine. The upsetter raises the edges of the blanks just slightly. The blanks keep on moving. The next stop, the coining presses. The blanks are stamped with the designs and inscriptions which make them genuine United States coins. The fastest presses strike 12 coins per second. So fast, you almost can't see what's happening. Take a close look at the results. The coins are spot checked for quality. A press operator uses a magnifying glass to examine each batch of new coins. Then, all the coins go through a coin sizer to remove any misshapen or dented ones. They are then counted and bagged. An automatic counting machine counts the coins and drops them into large canvas bags. The bags are sewn shut, loaded on pallets, and taken by forklifts to be stored in vaults. New coins are shipped to Federal Reserve Banks. From there, the coins go to your local bank. We invite you into the bank now to view this exhibit and learn about the history of money.